Okay, thank you. Thank you to be here. Um, today it's the last uh, round one warming up uh, meeting and uh, we have with us uh, Tommaso Mattei and Michael Eina from Nielsen. Uh, I remember you that uh, if you want to ask some questions, you have the chat below to, to write them up. And uh, then at the end of the, the presentation of Michael, I will be uh, asking them the questions. So thank you very much. I just leave the floor to, to Tommaso to introduce themselves and Michael, and then enjoy, enjoy the moment. Thank you. Thanks so much, Amadeo. Um, again here, again, very happy to be here in this second um, warming up we are joining as Nielsen. Um, as anticipated in the last warming up on the digital landscape, uh, uh, we were undertaking a journey in discovering uh, 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 the different angles, features, and, and behaviors of the sports community in Italy. And, um, and as anticipated, we wanted not just to describe a community, a phenomenon, a behavior, but also try to give some touch points and, and channels on how to enter and engage to this community, um, in particular for brands and non-endemic brands. So today is the day uh, we have Mikael Heina, uh, international uh, sorry, eSports lead for Nissan International that can share our, his expertise uh, coming from Europe, Middle East, Africa, and, and APAC. Uh, so a wealth of, of experience and insight he's, he's uh, dealing with. And so I'm very happy to, to leave the ground to him. Thanks, Miguel. Thanks, Tommaso. And thanks, Amadio. Hey, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon, wherever you might be joining us from. And um, again, thank you for, uh, for giving me the opportunity to show you some insights that we as Nielsen Esports um, have been put together in, in the past. And um, yeah, I guess approximately the next, yeah, not full hour, but um, at least 45 minutes, um, you will see some very interesting uh, insights, how brands are winning in esports and this from an international perspective. Um, Tomas already introduced me, so this um, gives me the opportunity to directly jump into the topic of the day. So I will give a quick introduction about, uh, about ourselves and why uh, we can share these insights with you, um, how, we, how we came across all these uh, insights. And then, of course, jump into three very interesting topics. The first one will be sponsoring platforms and generating exposure in esports. Um, how can you do this? What do you have to keep in mind when you, when you want to become a sponsor? Um, and uh, which tools can you use, for instance, or which tools have already been successfully used by brands, um, which we will show you in, uh, in two very interesting case studies also. Then, um, how to measure the holistic ROI of esports partnerships. I mean, the one thing it is, of course, to, um, to engage in esports and to, to be present in this, in this space. But um, navigating through a, through a new or new to the most of, uh, of the brand's new field um, without having any measurement is like driving in the fog with the eyes closed. So we'll give you some guidance how this can be done and how others have, have already been doing this. And then um, the last point, and um, I think this is uh, something that is not heavily underrated at the moment, but um, a tool that is not as, um, as publicly discussed like esports is gaming as a marketing tool for brands. And we have two uh, interesting case studies um, with us today to show you how this actually can be done and how you can integrate your brand um, into your game. So, and then of course, the last part will be uh, focused on, on your questions. Um, if you have anything, just put it into the chat and um, we, we will try to, to answer this in time. If not, um, we will make sure to come back to you and to answer your, your questions then later on via email or whatever channel you prefer. Okay, let's jump into a quick introduction. So Nielsen Esports, as Tomaso already said, um, I'm overlooking our esports activities, um, well, to be honest, in all the markets besides the US, so um, more or less global. And that's the thing, and that's what I really like about, about the power of Nielsen Esports. Our data is on the one hand global, so we can draw comparisons um, from China to, to Brazil, but also, um, without having the local knowledge, this would mean nothing. Um, this would just mean comparing data from Brazil to China, uh, which 
many people can do, but to really um, have the knowledge, what does it mean? What does actually Counter-Strike mean in Brazil in comparison to League of Legends in China, for instance? Um, this is really where, where we draw um, our power out of. And then of course, everything that we do is based on data. Um, I mean, we are Nielsen, so this is quite obvious. Um, for us, without data and um, without having the, this proper tools to advise people and uh, to have everybody navigate uh, the landscape, um, this would just not, not, not be our thing. We, we are not like, yeah, go there because it's cool. No, we say go there because the data tells you to go there. Um, and what we do with this, of course, um, we won't hide. We won't hide anything. Um, if there is, if there are some um, some fields or some areas in esports that um, are still to be discussed and to to become better, um, we point it out and uh, we we try to help. So, like um, when we entered esports a couple of years ago, um, we uh, established the Nielsen Esports Advisory Board, where companies like Twitch, YouTube, Turner, so may, very many media companies, but also brands like Procter and Gamble, um, and so on, uh, join us and um, discuss with us what KPIs are needed in esports. So what hasn't been there that Nielsen can bring to the table. And one thing is, and this is like the source of truth, um, AMA. What does it mean? It is called average minute audience. And this is um, an audience measurement KPI that can be used or that is used to compare the reach in platforms like Twitch or YouTube um, or even Mixer when it still existed, um, and to calculate the reach in a metric that can be compared to what you see in, uh, in television. And this is something that we are very proud of and um, that we see as, as, as a truth because um, there are many KPIs that you can, can use to, um, um, to look into audience measurement in esports and in general OTT but without having the possibility to compare this to your campaigns that you have um, on television or wherever, this just means nothing. Um, so who are we working with? Honestly, um, we are the neutral uh, partner in the middle of everything. We are working with game publishers and platforms. So like the, uh, the ESL or Riot Games, brands like, um, like Shell, like Porsche or whatsoever, leagues uh, and, uh, and other rights holders, um, even traditional sports, um, so like you may know the German football club Schalke 04, uh, so Schalke 04, um, and uh, they are one of the main investors in, uh, in, in esports with their League of Legends team, for instance. Um, agencies like Sport5 or, or Infront, and then of course media companies, as already mentioned, so like Twitch and YouTube and so on. And we are the neutral partner in the middle, meaning that uh, we don't owe anyone anything in terms of uh, the data is like it is, but um, we always find find a way to show you with our huge amount of benchmarking how to make something better, or if it's already good, how you how you still can improve, or if it's not that good, yeah, as I said, we show you, but we show you even ways how to uh, um, how to improve, or how, what others have done to improve themselves. One thing that is very important um, before we start in, into the topic, um, please keep in mind that gaming and esports aren't the same thing and are in the same target group. Um, let me quickly guide you through this. Gamers, of course, that's why they are called gamers, they like to play video games. But the thing is, watching other people playing computer games, so a passive consumption of uh, edu video, video gaming content is not important to them. Honestly, they just don't care. They want to play themselves. Esports fans, on the other hand, what really differentiates them from, from the gaming um, audience is, of course, they like to play video games themselves, even more than gamers. But the thing is, they also like um, to watch other people playing computer games or, well, video games, that is. And this is the main differentiator. Um, so thinking about gaming, and we will tackle this uh, at the end of this presentation, um, you find a very uh, different core audience, to be honest, a larger audience, because uh, esports per se is a part of gaming, but um, the gaming audience is broader. So if you think about maybe like, like an, an iceberg um, flowing in, in the water, 
the tip of the iceberg that flows um, above um, the water is like the esports audience and the, the much bigger part so like um, six out of seven is the gaming audience so the gaming audience is broader um, but the esports audience is the one that, that, that is easier uh, to target for us and there are interesting differences in those target groups because we see gamers have a high share of males in comparison to to the average uh, population in the country they are slightly younger than the average age Esports fans, on the other hand, they have a very high share of males, which is not a secret, but depending on the game, um, you have even uh, a higher share of females amongst this, and they have a much younger average age than the population, but they are not as young as you might think. So our studies found out that they are amongst their mid-20s and not like late teenagers, as many people think. One thing that came... Um, uh, that became very interesting and important, especially during this um, COVID pandemic that is going on, is virtual sports. So what does it mean? Virtual sports is, well, as you can tell by the name, um, the virtual representation of the actual sport. So like FIFA for, uh, for football slash soccer or Formula One, um, the game for Formula One, that is MotoGP game and so on and so on. Um, how does this fit in into gaming and esports? Into gaming, yes, of course, because it is gaming. How does it fit into esports? By now, from a commercial perspective, not so much because not many, not that many people actually watch. Formula One um, has had a very decent success over the last couple of months with their um, Formula One Championship Series and even broadcasting. Um, let's say, substitutional um, championships during uh, this COVID crisis when the, when the drivers couldn't drive in uh, with their real cars. Um, but the audience behind this resembles more the, the core audience of, um, of the actual game rather than, uh, than it is uh, uh, an esports audience. So going now into, with this keeping, with keeping this in mind, going now into, um, well, if you are a brand, how can I do this? How can I enter actually, uh, actually the esports scene? So from, from what we learned in the past, all we that are, uh, that are used to seeing sponsoring and so on, we are used to seeing exactly this, what you see here on the left side of the screen. We see very personalized um, advertisement tools. So like jersey sponsorship, or even advertisement boards in, in the arena, um, with especially having the, um, the personalized advertising tools, like again, jersey sponsorship, being also a multiplier with secondary coverage by newspapers and so on and so on. But everything is mostly focused on the, um, on the people. And of course, with a wide angle view, you have the advertisement boards and so on that are visible from home and in stadium, of course. So please keep in mind, what you are used to see is let's say in-game focused. If we now switch into, into the esports mode, quotes on and off, um, <laughs> if, but starting with the traditional sports first, we have uh, an, an example from, uh, from handball uh, here in Germany. And uh, I think this really shows you how far it can go with the in-game advertisement. I'm not gonna count how many different um, sponsorship messages you can see here on screen, but I think it suffices to say it's quite a lot. And within eSports, um, you really don't have that much exposure in the game. So how do you win? You would win more with digital overlays. There are some first tries and we will go through them too, to, um, have in-game advertisement in esports titles in esports broadcasts, but mostly the um, the exposure that you get comes out of um, so-called digital overlays and on-screen branding. So, if we now look into, as I just uh, began to outline, um, what are the ways how you can get exposure in esports? There are some uh, some some simple ways. So um, you, can, you can look, of course, as I said, into the broadcaster, which means that you have um, like this, uh, th like the logo placement on screen in, um, in a broadcast and so on. 
this is the main source of uh, of exposure that you, that that you should keep in mind of course if at one point in time, not if, when and at one point in time, we hopefully will be uh, allowed again to go into venues and um, to really watch esports events live at a stadium. Then of course you have all the tools we just discussed. You have perimeter advertisement, you have broadcaster decks, you have also LED boards and so on and so on. Um, we will show you later on what, what how this can be brought to life, but this is more or less the traditional way of sponsorship that you know. Then one thing that you please should keep in mind, um, let's say um, the equipment in, um, that you need for, for playing esports or, or gaming um, is like the sports manufacturer you know from, um, from traditional, traditional sports, so like Adidas, um, producing the football that you need to play with. Here it is uh, chair manufacturers, computer manufacturers, of course. Um, screen manufacturers, headsets, um, and other peripherals that you really need to play. So these are the, um, the sports manufacturers, and they are heavily important, of course, but also you can brand the equipment with your brand. Please keep this in mind too. Then looking into the team side of things, apparel. So of course, the team jersey, which still is the main advertisement tool for, for a team because that's their DNA that they show. And if you are in their DNA on the jersey, that is a very valuable thing. But we will show you how you actually can really get into the jersey and then still be seen on screen. And as I said, in game, we will talk about this in a couple of minutes. So to start with, uh, I brought with me some, some, uh, some case studies. Let's look at first at Kia. Um, they are sponsoring the ADC, so uh, the European League of Legends series, the highest European League of Legends uh, league there is, and with, with world, world class sports. Kia is one of the main sponsors, and um, they have all in all more than 10 on screen assets which are visible during different stages of the broadcast. But 88% of the exposure that, they, that Kia gets is driven by four main assets, as you can see here on screen. So you have during the break and countdown, you have the logo by Kia on screen. Then you have the sponsorship rotation, as you already pointed out, during the actual playing time. So when the, play, uh, when the game is being played, you have this on screen. Then you have an overlay that uh, takes, um, takes over the screen. That's why it's called an overlay. And during team composition uh, and um, choosing of, uh, of the heroes you want to play, um, also Kia is then, then visible. visible which again leads to 88% of exposure is driven by four main assets. Also, if you think about it, um, shoulder, uh, shoulder content, so like the countdown or the team composition accounts for 44% of the exposure. So 56% of their exposure comes out of the actual playing time. 44% of the exposure comes out of shoulder content. And this is heavily different to traditional types of sports because as we already saw, when you are the jersey partner, then more or less only when the ball is rolling uh, during, um, during a football match, then you are being seen. Here, you, all, you also have much, much more visibility, not only during the game, but also during the shoulder content, which is pre or post game. Then again, when we will be allowed to, to go back into arenas again, um, this is one of my favorite examples um, because Vodafone, if you see here on the, uh, on the left upper side, really took over the arena. Um, the color, the look and feel, everything in this specific point in time is Vodafone branded. And that is really cool because in this moment, everything is, is like red and um, you, you can see and almost taste the Vodafone brand. So this not only gives you um, exposure during um, uh, with TVGI, as we discussed um, with Kia, for instance, but it also gives you a huge exposure to the people inside of the arena. And again, seeing this, uh, the arena totally in red is something that if you are from, from, from the band Vodafone really makes you feel, yes, we are super integrated. And um, this is really that brings us value. And how much does it bring you value? Um, this. Um, Arena branding, all in all, 
was 30% of the media equivalency value um, that Vodafone got out of this specific tournament. So um, a large portion of their return on sponsorship uh, investment comes out of being visible inside of the arena. If you now look again into, if you are a studio-based um, uh, league, like it is the League of Legends LEC, um, they did a very clever thing because they see their teams as partners and that's why uh, they gave them uh, a very cool camera angle so that not only their own partners are very positively being presented on screen, but also the team apparel um, has a very huge amount of time that it is being seen on screen. Even over one third of the time, um, you can see team jerseys. Um, so when you are partnering not with the league, but with the team, it's not like you are not being seen at all because again, the players are playing the game, but they are not being seen inside of the screen as you can see here during this um, League of Legends game, but you have a portion of the screen where the jersey can be seen. And this is good because again, um, you don't have any exposure for the teams inside of, of the game. So Riot Games thought about how can we help our teams? How can we partner with them? And that's why they structured the camera angle to be um, as good as it is so that the team partners also are being seen on screen at a good amount of time. So still, if we think about jersey sponsorship and again, think about, well, we, what do we know from, uh, from traditional um, sports? The front of the jersey always makes us feel, yes, this is the most important part of the, of the jersey. Yes and no. Um, because if you keep in mind the camera angle, how it did show the players, the most important part of the jersey are the shoulders. Um, this might look small to you, but still in a broadcast environment that we are in here in, in eSports, um, the jersey is the most vital part. You can have a large logo here, but if the screen of, uh, of the people cuts it off, then you have nothing out of it. So here really, that is the, the main thing where you want to be with, with your brand logo, with your, uh, um, with the message that you want to send to the audience. I already mentioned it like a couple of times. Um, teams don't have any in-game exposure. Yes, and that's why uh, they, um, they talk to the, um, to the rights holders, how they can be seen better on screen. And again, Riot Games did a, a very good job. BSL is working on integrating the, the teams into the broadcast much better. But the thing is, um, the game itself by now mostly has been um, more or less clean, so to speak. Um, what we see now with the, um, with the um, summer split from the LEC, for instance, they had a very proper in-game advertisement. So they allowed their partners to already be visible inside of the game. And our data shows that um, this kind of sponsorship has a very high acceptance amongst the fans. Over 70% of the fans say, yes, for me, that's totally okay. Why? because it's not intrusive. Sponsorship in the back doesn't really hurt your, your viewership experience. People see it passively, but it doesn't really interfere um, like, like a shared screen or whatsoever during a game. Um, having this doesn't really interfere with your view, uh, viewing experience. So, oh, sorry, wrong direction. So how can it be done um, besides uh, the, uh, the already discussed League of Legends uh, integration. I have a very interesting case here from, from ESL's Dota 2 um, integration. Um, what you always should keep in mind is if you integrate your brand into a game, like I don't know if you can see the cursor um, or my mouse pointer here, but um, as you can see on the upper screenshot, there is the brand logo that you can see. But in the next second, um, the game evolves and um, one of the players uses a spell and all of a sudden your brand is not being seen anymore because you are just part of the game. You should keep this in mind that it's a risky um, bet that you are doing. But again, it is a very clever way to, um, to give you um, future exposure. 
so wrapping up, um, we have been talking now about how you can integrate your brand message, your logo in, uh, in several ways into a broadcast. But um, we all know, and not, not only with the pandemic, um, we all are being asked questions. So, well, what does it bring? What's the ROI of, um, of things? And um, looking now into how can you measure what you just saw um, is uh, for us pretty easy because this is again our DNA, showing brands and helping rights holders to show the actual value that they get out of, um, out of sponsorship. This is our bread and butter business, um, to be honest. So what we already saw now, we discussed the exposure part, um, how, you can, how, how you can win with your logo being seen on screen because this is one, one, and the, one of the major parts of sponsorship, it's brand exposure. Without this, um, it wouldn't really work. Then of course, you have to look into the fan base. Who am I targeting? Who are those people that receive my brand message? Are those the people that I actually want to target or is it not my target group that usually um, buys my products? Um, awareness and engagement. A lot of has been discussed and rumored about the esports audience being so super engaged with with everything that they see and and do, and uh, which opens you to, I have to say it, to a shitstorm if you are not doing this co correctly. Yeah, we will talk about this in a couple of minutes. And of course, one thing that you definitely should not go overlooked is the business impact impact of things. If your goal is in sponsorship at first to to raise awareness to you uh, have the sponsorship paying into your brand equity, then everything is cool. Then you, maybe business impact is like the third or fourth step. But if you really want to get a direct ROI out of this, then of course you have to measure your business impact and keep this into the, into the modeling. Again, as we already talked about brand exposure um, in the first part, I'm, I'm going to skip this and um, focus on, well, what does it bring to be a sponsor in, in esports, we brought with us here today uh, an example from uh, from the Overwatch League out of the U.S. And um, we have two questions, um, more questions than that, as you can see here. But on the left side, we have two questions that we ask the people. At first, that is the toughest currency in sponsorship research: the unaided sponsorship awareness. We ask the people. Um, what sponsors are you aware of in esports, or what um, what sponsors are you aware of uh, in the Overwatch League? And then uh, there's an open text field, and people have to enter uh, the brands that they saw. So this is really the toughest, but also the most honest um, way of of seeing how you really um, perform. Because if you are not mentioned here, that means that your brand message hasn't come through enough. If you now compare this to traditional sports, what we saw in esports here. And it's, it is very, really super interesting to see how good actually uh, the results are. Because 31% of the, um, uh, of, no, let me put it in, in another way. The average um, awareness was at 31% unaided. That means that, um, in comparison to sports naming rights norm, which means that it's like a stadium naming right, and people really know the stadium rights, uh, stadium naming rights, or uh, team naming rights, for instance, um, this outperforms even that. And this is really a super valuable tool having the naming right. And just normal average partners from the Overwatch League outperform this by 4% points. Looking now into the average sports sponsor, they get 6% unaided awareness. And you can see 25% points between this is really a heavy difference. So um, being in, in an uh, environment that we just talked about, which is not so cluttered like traditional sports and gives you very clever ways of integrating a brand message really pays off here. Also, if you now look into the aided sponsorship awareness, all right, now, naming rights from stadiums and so on overtake a bit uh, the league partners from the Overwatch League, but still, it's only by 3% points. And again, we are talking about multi-million multi, 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 multi dollar investments over a long 
um, amount of time when you um, buy a stadium naming right, you should do this for a long time because only having this for a year doesn't do anything for your brand. Same goes with for esports partnerships, of course, but um, the added awareness levels are almost equal. And now looking into the standard sports tier one partners, which are still jersey sponsors and so on, um, this is outperformed still by 35% points in between. And as you can see, it really pays off from an awareness perspective um, to, to become a sponsor in esports. Also, awareness, of course, is one thing, but if you are a brand that is already like known by 98% of, um, of the people, you want to do something with your brand. You want to push brand favorability. You want to push, uh, push brand equity. So um, we see that in all this, um, three um, um, tiers that we have been looking into, so the league partners from the Overwatch League, but also the naming rights or um, tier one sport partners, more or less the favorability um, doesn't change. But having a heavy effect amongst more people is better than having uh, a good effect amongst less people, right? So 14% um, in, brand equity, uh, in, in brand favorability push among 61% means really, really a lot. So keep in mind that um, if you want to become um, a sponsor in, in eSports, it pays off from this perspective and again, wrong direction. Um, and why does it pay off? So what we saw is um, the attitude towards sponsorship amongst eSports fans is super positive. Not only that, but if you, if you look into um, the, the red part of, of the columns here, um, very many people are not negative towards sponsorship. And that is very important. We don't see this anymore in other types of sports because it is um, very commercialized and even some people um, tend to react cynic uh, towards sponsorship. In esports, you don't have this yet. You are still at a very good point if you do a clever brand integration. Um, as we saw before, people react positively and how it pays off, you just saw with good uh, and positive brand favorability and a very good brand awareness amongst um, the fans. So of course, um, having this, uh, the direct return, so to speak, in, uh, in being in the people's minds is one thing, but you also definitely should be aware that you have the power of the, so of the combined social media channels of all the teams, for instance. This is a huge asset. Um, having sponsorship exposure, so a logo placement is one thing, but this only comes alive if you think about having clever activations using the, um, the team's players and um, creating with them very clever campaigns. As you saw from, uh, from the German car brand BMW, for instance, uh, they partnered with the five top worldwide um, League of Legends teams and called this engagement united in rivalry, which is a very clever thing to do because um, you focus on one type of, of esports, which, which is League of Legends in, in this instance, and have so a global audience where you say, okay, um, we are neutral, but we unite this, this teams in rivalry. And so you can go through all those social media channels that really drive high engagements um, per post. And this is very, very interesting uh, and not only rumored, but as you can see, a true thing in esports, um, activations on social media have a very positive impact on, uh, on the campaigns that have been, have been pushed through. And besides using this more or less classical approach of having posts um, with, um, with a team or doing clever video content uh, and so on, I mean, um, in esports and maybe also gaming, but we will tackle this again in a couple of minutes, there is much, much more that, that, that you can do. Um, as you may have seen, Fortnite and Travis Scott a couple of weeks ago, they uh, had this very clever integration of him uh, doing, a, doing three or four concerts um, in the game when the game was paused. Everybody could do the, uh, the Fortnite dances uh, to his music. 
and this really heavily paid off for him and uh, also for for Nike. Um, I'm not going into too, into too much details, but let me say it heavily paid off for the both of them. So all in all, now what should we do to really calculate uh, the sponsorship ROI out of this? I'm not going to do, go into too much details if you want to reach out to me afterwards, but we already saw we have the tangible impact, meaning we have the brand exposure on the one hand in, in several um, media channels, so broadcast, even online media, for instance, um, usually print, but this is for esports, not important, and social media, as already said, which is a very vital uh, part of all your esports strategies in the future. And then on the other hand, of course, you have, um, as we saw with the Overwatch example, so how did this really pay off in terms of do the, did the people notice, did they like it or not? How does this impact on your brand and so on and so on. And if by going through this funnel then eventually into even consideration and first choice and by combining all of this with our metrics and the media value that we already discussed earlier during, um, during the first part of the session, this can lead to for you to return on investment or return on sponsorship investment. So is it plus one or is it below one? Um, the question that we always, always, of course, get asked. All right, so one is like one to one. So if you invest one euro into sponsorship and get one, one euro out of the sponsorship, what does it actually mean? And how does esports differ from, um, from traditional types of sports? Well, um, what we see in esports is that um, with the very, very, very professional leagues, um, they target to be between three and five to one ROI. And uh, this is a real good ROI. Um, this is a very good return on sponsorship investment that, that you can reach, but we see a lot of examples where this is even above this. So we, it's not seldom that we see even a 10 to one return on sponsorship ROI. And um, if you think about showing your, uh, your managers or uh, in the next team meeting, how good your, your eSports sponsorship paid off, and you can show, show them, yeah, in sponsorship return, we had like a 10 to one return. Yeah, I mean, um, he will be the employee of the month, I guess. But um, thinking about where does this value now come from? And um, it's still the most uh, valuable driver that we see is the broad broadcast and the streaming value. Without this exposure, um, nothing will happen in the minds of the people. Digital and social is a very good thing for fan engagement, but as a value driver, uh, here in media, uh, in media return, not so super important. But what we saw, uh, the business and sales impact for, for uh, the brands that we analyzed in this regards, 30% of their return came, came from there. So measuring really how the sales went, uh, integrating their own sales data. Um, please keep in mind, eSports sponsorship is not like performance marketing. So it's not um, usually... Um, being done to track every mouse click that you have during um, during an, a broadcast in Twitch or whatsoever. So this is a bit different how we how we approach things here, but still it can be measured and as you see has a very vital part in the ROI calculation that you should do before really entering esports. So summing this up, um, we talked about esports, which is the professional video game side of things. But um, one thing that I always like to point out, this is only one thing um, or one side of the story. The other side of the story, which is a bit more, not, not difficult, but a bit, let's say more unknown to most of the people is, user, is really using gaming as a marketing tool. So I brought with me two case studies here. Uh, one is from um, Nissin Cup Noodles and Square Enix Final Fantasy series, where they integrated their products in a, uh, in a very clever way into the game, into the real actual game that people play, not only watch, but really play. And then um, had also limited supply products, um, which is a very clever way of putting your product into a game. And as you can see here on the left-hand side, um, with a non-intrusive, but still very believable way how you can integrate yourself into the game. Um, 
how we can uh, how we can really measure and and help people to to navigate the the gaming scene is by our super data service um, those guys have been working on gaming for ages so not since uh, since the beginning of video gaming but almost and um, this is one of them of their uh, favorite examples it even has been has been watched like a hundred thousand hours on twitch and reached eight million active users in the game so as you can see this are not only uh, high numbers but those are numbers that our super data service was uh, capable in measuring and showing okay for cup noodles this in-game integration really went well now thinking about <coughs> sorry um now thinking about what else can there be done um I left out the game of FIFA for a reason, because as I already said in, in the introduction, virtual sports are not a very vital part of esports. But of course, um, sports simulations are a very vital part of video gaming and a very super important part of video gaming. Um, <clears throat> the new upcoming FIFA 21 title, of course, will as always break records when, uh, when, when it comes to the release day, when it has been released. But um, you can also use <laughs> uh, characters from, from the actual game to use them as a brand ambassador for you. And Coke is one of the most clever examples that I've seen in this field. They used the in-game character Alex Hunter and made him a brand ambassador for Coke. I mean, this is taking a not really in the... Um, in the reality existing person and making it your brand ambassador. How cool is that, to be honest? And um, they, as you can see, they, they made even cans with him uh, and so on. But it doesn't stop here. Um, Real Madrid even made jerseys with Alex Hunter on, on him. So, um, I mean, this is playing around and fooling around with, with video gaming and content. But this shows that um, well, there are no boundaries, to be honest. Um, of course, you have to talk to, to EA Sports to be able to do this. But as you can see, it's not like they say, no, uh, we will never do anything clever or um, we will never do anything that is out of the box, as, um, as you can see. This is something that really stands out from, from my perspective, because again, this is taking only virtually really um, existing things and putting them <laughs> to purchase for really existing people. And I mean, if you think about integrating into gaming, this is really how you can integrate yourself in a very true, believable way into gaming. All right. Thank you very much for listening. Um, here are my contact details um, if, you want, uh, if you want to reach out to me. And we still have a couple of minutes left, I think. So I would like to hand over to you guys um, if there are any questions that you want to ask. <clears throat> do do you hear me? Yes. yes. Hello. Okay. So um, if anyone has any question, just use the chat below and write anything you want to ask to to Michael, and uh, and he will try to to answer that. So if you have uh, any comment, uh, any ads to 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 his presentation who, in my opinion, was, was really, really, really interesting. And, uh, and uh, super, super congrats, uh, Michael, because it was uh, a really interesting content. Yeah. Cool. Hello. OK. Someone is uh, saying hi, and I think uh, is going to ask a question now. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but it's a very polite way of uh of he, uh, asking a question by saying hi at first. He asked if, do you have any specific insight on the Italian market? Yes, we do. Um, uh, I won't go into too much details now because uh. um, stay tuned for Monday. That's all I want to say. Amadio, over to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, our, Michael was to, 
was about to tell that on Monday we are going to to unveil our new Italian esports market report, so yeah. directly from uh, from round one. So a lot of new insights about the the national market will be so shared uh, next Monday from the, the voice of Tommaso and uh, Michael was will be also joining us for yeah. uh, an international benchmark, so a, a comparison with uh, what is happening on the, on the international level. Yeah, so absolutely. That's it. Any other question? So just FYI, um, uh, we can share the presentation uh, later amongst the participants. So no worries, uh, we will send you this. And um, so you can go through the content. I know it's a lot to take in <laughs> at, um, at the Thursday morning, but um, yeah, <laughs> sometimes the questions come when, when you have more time to read what is written on the slide uh, than yeah. just somebody voicing it over. Yeah, yeah. I have another one, okay. All right. I'm excited. Yeah, we're just waiting. <laughs> Type faster. <laughs> yes, it's uh, like a <laughs> <hype> amplifier. <laughs> ah, there it is. Okay, do you have any information of any sport related brand investing in traditional sport? Um, yeah, of course. I mean, uh, tons of those. Um, or is, is there an, another question to this? Okay, uh, I'm trying to, to understand the question. Mm -hmm. um, just wait. Yeah, of course. So, Luca, uh, just correct me if I understand the question right. Uh, okay, esport related brand. Okay, okay. So, do you have any information of any esport related brand investing in traditional sports? So, like the, the, the ah. contrast. Okay, so some esports brands investing in traditional sport, esport endemic brand. So, do you have any any information, any case history, or maybe insights about that? It's yeah. already happened or might happen in the future. What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. So um, we can tackle this um, from from two ways, I, I think. Um, let's start with the uh, with the easier way to really look again into the sports manufacturers for esports. So the endemic brands like Intel, or um, or AMD, or um, Razer, Huawei, and so on and so on. Um, yes, of course. I mean, who, we see Huawei, for instance. Um, sponsoring not only esports events uh, and especially mobile esports events, but they also are partnering with the um, Chinese Super League, for instance, in, in football and um, getting eyeballs there and um, trying to, to reach uh, a different target group. In terms of like Razer or um, if you go to, um, to any other smaller and even more en endemic uh, partner, not so many yet. I mean, you have partnerships with uh, um, between esports teams, so like um, Face Clan, and let's say with uh, Manchester, Manchester City. City. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, which which is a very clever way for the for both of them because you have uh, an endemic team with uh, partnering more on the merchandise side of things with Man City. And of course, this also pays off for, for their partners. But this is an, an indirect investment um, that those um, partners from, man, uh, sorry, from, from Face Clan have gotten. So um, it is something that just, that, that just happened. Um, am I expecting brands like Turtle Beach or Cooler Master or whatsoever to have investments in traditional sports? The question is why? I mean, um, you are looking for a, de for a dedicated target group that wants to buy your, uh, your products and the scatter loss that you would have by targeting just the sports audience um, without really knowing are they interested in, in those product categories Gaming. or not. 
yeah, it's, it's tough. I mean, of course, if you look into, into um, the easy area, uh, Tim, um, there can be um, um, uh, I, I forgot the word. That's, that's, that's incredible. Uh, there, there can be endemic partners, of course, but what is it? It's still FIFA, right? So it's more like the, the copy of the, of the traditional sports. So again, the short answer for me would be maybe in the future, but the investment is rather high with an unclear outcome. So um, this would depend on the case, but I rather doubt it. Okay, Stefano Zocchi asking, apologies if this has been discussed earlier, I could only join halfway through, but are there are any emerging nations that you think will play a significant role in the esports sector in the future? <laughs> Very good question, and this has not been discussed during the call, so thank you for, uh, for, for bringing this up. Um, in terms of emerging, uh, emerging markets, it's more like looking into what are the emerging um, devices that, that will be used. Will it still be um, the traditional computer that we will be still playing on or will, will this be more like mobile? And if we stay mobile, which is like a 99% uh, thing to look into, then now the, uh, for us, still emerging market which is far ahead of us, is uh, Southeast Asia, for instance. Um, mobile gaming is their just um, their normal way of living, so to speak. And um, for us, this is really the market where this is really heavily kicking off. So from a European perspective, if you want to, um, if you want to look into emerging markets, yes, that's, uh, that's really the thing. But if you're looking into insights like, Okay, from an esports perspective, what will be uh, the next hub for League of Legends? Could this be the Czech Republic or so? Um, I don't have my, my, my glass bowl with me to, to look into that. But again, um, if you structure it like the way I already did, um, really looking into, into the Southeast Asian region is something that you definitely should do. Okay, thank you. Let's see if there is any other question from yeah. someone or. Okay. <clears throat> Continuing the same topic. Do you expect Europe and or US and Southeast A Asia to bridge the gap at some point in terms of the vast difference of games and platform used? Oh. <clears throat> No, um, not with an exclamation mark, but, but with a dot behind it. Um, my reasoning behind this is that uh, the cultural differences between, let's say, the Western markets, so like Europe, and let's say we include the US in, into this, and, uh, and um, Asia. all over Asia, <laughs> and especially focusing on Southeast Asia, they are huge. And uh, mobile device usage is uh, something, I mean, very cultural already in, in, in this region. So um, maybe we will catch up at one point um, from a European perspective. But if we catch up, then there will be already the next gadget that uh, those guys will be ahead of us. So um, in terms of an overarching uh, esports world, yes, there are already, um, already tournaments in place. So like PUBG Mobile with their um, um, open with their club series and um, with with the World Championship that will be played in Southeast Asia or has been played in Malaysia um, last uh, last year in, in December. So no surprise. Um, so this is already something global, but um, the sea region is far ahead of us, and uh, there is a small footway for us in, into this world. But again, uh, it, it moves so fast that it is tough for us to really um, stay ahead or even catch up. Okay. I hope this answered the question.
Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. Answer. Yeah, thank you, uh, Stefano Zocchi. So okay. I think that's it. So I would like to thank you, Michael. Yeah, and uh, you, it Michael. was really interesting. And see you, see you on Monday. It will Absolutely. be a great day with tons of content, tons of similar content for for everybody who will be interested in. So thank you very much. And uh, as as Michael said, uh, if you have any other question in the, in the next few days, just uh, just write me or write us to 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 share them and to to answer them. So thank you very much, and then see you on Monday. Bye bye. Thank you guys.